got to get to interpretation. Three nights is hard. So why don't you just take one, pass it around. Oh, good. That looks like a good look there. So, I'm struggling with this thing a little bit still, so. Teacher's pet. You're in good shape. I appreciate it. What's that? Level the other yeah. This one? The other side. No, I think it's the bottom one closest to you on the other side. Oh. Unless you're it up. I'm wanting, I'm wanting it even. I'm wanting it even. Yeah. Lower that one or raise the other. Dude, it it's the work. middle. The middle. Yeah. When tension is on, it doesn't move. Yeah, these boys now. <laughs> <laughs> No, sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I just let me help you with that. I just bought one. I saw it last week. Yeah. I've got one at home from when I was in. I thought you were an engineer. Um, yeah, but not. I'm civil, not mechanical. <laughs> I just not be able to spell engineer. Now I want one. Is that going to be any help to you? No. He, he said he uses the Google. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, where have we been? We have looked at in our flow chart. What are the three main steps of hermeneutics? First, right. Yeah. Application, yeah. And really, hermeneutics deals with the observation and interpretation. And so, uh, the way I envision this section is really the main part of what hermeneutics is about. And I envision this to be kind of like a tool belt. Uh, you've, you've observed, in fact, at the end of your uh, the goal of observation, there is a observation sheet right here that I gave you. This, this would be in your la last week's packet. But uh, this is how I envision you would start. If you have a text, you, be, you uh, prepare to start. To, uh, do, do I have this thing on? Yes. Okay. It is on? Okay. Okay. So you start... Uh, by preparing, you gather your materials. I've got flow charts, okay? You do the upper level, you know, you're going to pray. One, one of the things that's important is to have a blank notepad or something that you can write on and start writing down the observations that you see in a text or maybe in the margin or something. But really, you start... Uh, Several, I'll, I'll, I can fill up several sheets of paper just through this observation process. You look at um, your upper level observation, that's your big, big picture stuff author, location, audience, you know, geopolitical. And then you, and that's a, there's an observation sheet. Remember, I've given you a whole checklist on that. So that would be your first checklist. The second, you do your sentence and immediate context. So you're looking at all of your, your nouns, your verbs, your pronouns. You're looking at all of that. So the, and that's, that's in a, you know, I've given you checklists for that. So, you, so by the time you get down to here, then uh, at, at this point, I think you observe everything that you have that for yourself, and only then... Uh, I might recommend that you start doing some commentary review just to start seeing. Um, uh, but right now you're writing down um, thoughts that you're, you're seeing. And then you, you're coming up with uh, um, like this observation sheet and uh, all, this, all these observations you've made and all that. And what you're ending up with is this uh, question and resource list. You're not trying to answer everything. You're not trying to interpret everything. You're trying to observe everything and become saturated with the particulars of the text. 
So by the time you finish your observation process, you should have a list of the following. Key observations of what is said. Key observations of what is not said. Key questions that demand an answer. And any resources that you may have need to go answer those questions. So you're not trying to necessarily answer them. You're just trying to discover question and set the tone for your interpretation process. So then you begin your interpretation. Start moving into that. Now you've pre- got all the details. All you're very much acquainted <coughs> with the text. You know what it says. Now you're asking, what does it mean? And you're, you're moving to that. And so I envision, uh, as, I, as I teach this, um, in settings where I teach the whole course, I uh, look, think of it as a miner. You're a miner digging for gold. And you've got all kinds of tools on your tool belts. And so uh, I'm thinking of the interpretation process as, uh, or the rules of, rules of hermeneutics, the what, how, however you want to, I look at them as tools, tools to go in to mine out the truth. And, uh, and so what we're looking for is that vein of gold. And, and we're looking for that vein of God-inspired truth, <coughs> not human uh, uh, derived, human interpreted, but but God inspired truth, I and mean, that's what we're. That's the gold vein, and so uh, I think of this interpretation process as as a as a belt of tools, uh, mining truth. And I have probably in this course probably fifteen solid, fifteen different principles, roughly. That uh, are very simple, very straightforward. Um, some of them a little more in detail, and I had to pick. Well, okay, where do I even start? And so uh, I'm starting with, which is really one principle, and that's really all I was able to. All, all I printed out for you was the one principle um, of single meaning, and uh, um, we'll talk through it tonight. Uh, because that really becomes one of the foundation fundamental issues when you're looking for a meaning. What specifically are you looking for? Single meaning, uh, and and um, I advocate that the text has one meaning. As with any words on any page, there's one intended sense, and that that is what we're looking for. And um, and uh, so what we'll what we'll do tonight is look at this principle of single meaning, and we'll uh, interact with that. And um, but this really becomes one of the core issues in in modern hermeneutics, uh, and uh, very important. So I start where I like to start, and that's with just looking at Jesus' hermeneutic. I've studied a lot of, about that, and uh, there are a couple of texts in the Old Testament that seems to be Jesus' favorites. Uh, uh, and, well, if you gauge it by how many times he used it, you can't really say it's his favorite, but, uh, but uh, one of those is... Uh, Hosea 6.6. 6. And Hosea 6.6 6 says, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and knowledge, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So that, that's a um, very direct statement. Uh, Hosea 6. That's the N- yeah, updated, New American Standard update. What is the ESV? Or are you, what are you? Okay. No, yeah. Yeah, it's ESV. In fact, in, in, okay. I've got several in here. If you look like on, on page one, uh, Hosea 6.6 6 in the King James says, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. 
um, the ESV, I, for I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. Uh, the new, a, new American update, for I delight in loyalty. What word do we have there? Do you know your Hebrew? It's that word that sometimes, it's that really significant Hebrew word. Hesed, right? I'm, I look for covenant loyalty. I am, that, I am looking for, and so sometimes our translators translate that as mercy, compassion, steadfast love, loyalty, uh, loving kindness, uh, some of the, the words. So look at what happens, just to get you an idea of what's going on in Hosea. Uh, uh, you know, you've got the first four chapters, you're really dealing with uh, two main characters, really, Gomar and who? Hosea. Hosea, yes, and Gomar has got a problem, right? She's an unfaithful woman, right? Hosea loves her, keeps taking her back, and, um, and he's painting a picture here. There's a picture here. God loves Israel, but Israel is like Gomar. She'll, times get tough. She does come back, but then her, she runs off again. So it's about a faithful God and an unfaithful Israel, a faithful husband and an unfaithful wife. And so that's developed, and then you get... Uh, into chapter 6, and it opens up, and it almost looks exciting. Uh, Hosea 6.1, Come, let us return to the Lord, for He has torn us, but He will heal us. He has wounded us, but He will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up the third day so that we may live before Him. So let us press on to know the Lord. His goings forth are as certain as the dawn, and He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering the earth. So you think, okay, Israel is really coming to a repentant place. And then, but then, look at God's response there in verse 4. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and the dew which goes away early. So he takes, his two, he takes two pictures, gives us two pictures of Israel's loyalty. Sounds pretty good, but what is saying? It looks, what is, what is the um, uh, uh, morning cloud? What does that promise or look like? Maybe some kind of refreshment or whatever, but then it's, it disappears, right? May look like there might be something coming. The dew, right? The dew, it's there early, you know, and then it's gone. The, what he's picturing here is something that is fleeting, something that is there, but it's fleeting. Looks promising, but fleeting. And then he goes on in chapter five, verse 5, Therefore I have hewn them into pieces by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. So he said, look, your, your, your loyalty is fleeting. And then God says, for I delight in loyalty. That's what I'm after. Okay? So going to the uh, New Testament, Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, and I've got it there on page 1. Uh, what's happening in Matthew chapter 9, uh, Jesus quotes this verse. In verse 13, and to back up a little bit, Jesus goes in verse 9, he goes uh, and he sees a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said, follow him, and he got up and followed him. So Matthew is called, follow him. Then it happened, and uh, Jesus was reclining at the table in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need of a physician, but go, but those who are sick. But go, learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners. So here's uh, on page one. Jesus uses Hosea 6.6, 6, and several observations are important here to, to note about what Jesus does here. First of all, he recognizes that 
Scripture has meaning, right? Uh, go and learn. It has meaning. That can be learned. But notice also what this means is singular. Go learn what this means. In other words, don't go out and come back with a good interpret. Go come out with a valid interpretation. Right? He's saying there is a meaning there. You need to go and you learn, need to learn what that singular meaning is and you need to uh, apply your mind to that. Uh, meaning is singular here. And so uh, what happens is the Pharisees, had they understood the principle uh, in Hosea 6.6, 6, uh, they would have understood that God is merciful that God is compassionate, like Hosea, wanting his people to come to him. He's wanting sinners to turn to him, to come and embrace him. He's wanting covenant loyalty. And what Matthew and some of these, quote, sinners are doing, are exhibiting the kind of response to God that God is looking for, what Hosea is looking for to leave the, your world, to come to Him and join. So that's what's taking place. And they, instead, they put up this uh, appearance of loyalty and concern about God and the things of God, but, uh, but they didn't understand the principle. Spend more time, I, I would really love to go more deeply with that. But I just want to um, uh, move on to verse 12, or chapter 12. Uh, but do you, do you understand? And, and, well, let's go through chapter 12, and then we'll ask some questions, and then we can um, draw some conclusions from this. So now, chapter 12 happens, and what's going on this time is that uh, Jesus goes through the grain fields, chapter one, verse 1, on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry, and they began to pick the heads of grain and eat. So they were going through, walking through, picking up the grains, rubbing them in their hands and eating the grain. Uh, but when the Pharisees saw this, they said, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, and he and his companions, how he entered the house of God, how they ate the consecrated bread, uh, which is not lawful for him to eat? Or have you not read in the uh, law that on the sa Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. And then he takes them back to Hosea 6.6. 6. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. So here, the situation is different. In the case that um, you got a different case here, but what's the Pharisees again are coming up saying, "Look, you guys are doing what is unlawful." And the reality is, they weren't doing anything unlawful according to the Mosaic Code. They could uh, uh, eat. What they couldn't do is uh, engage in commercial activity, the regular business, and, and harvest, and, and all that. But they could eat what they were. Uh, what was uh, at issue was really a man-made tradition. So, Jesus said, but you are, uh, if you had known what this means, you would not have condemned the innocent. All of these people here that are doing this are innocent, but you have condemned them because you don't know what this means. You don't know uh, what Hosea 6, 6 means. And uh, again, there's this appearance of loyalty, this appearance that Jesus is calling them on, uh, there's, and um, their fleeting loyalty, and he's saying, uh, go again, learn what this means. So again, he's saying, Scripture has meaning, that text has meaning, that applies to this situation, and, um, and it can be learned, you should not know it, and it's singular. What this means is singular. But in this case, it's applied to a different situation. And that's what I want you to get. You see, he used Hosea 6.6 6 
two completely different settings, but he uses the same meaning, I desire loyalty. These disciples in the grain fields are displaying loyalty. The tax collectors and sinners were displaying loyalty. The Pharisees were not. He didn't change the meaning of Hosea 6.6. 6. He just applies it to a different situation. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'd give you another one, but we don't need, that's, that's going to be enough example for that. But the application is, I mean, how does that apply to this? How, how does a tax collector have more loyalty than, I mean, Pharisees or whatever, but the tax collector was seen as somehow Because they, right. think about what Matthew did. Jesus said, come, follow me. Okay. Right. And he leaves. That's covenant loyalty. That's what God, that's what he's looking for. And he's not looking for pretended loyalty. He's looking for true loyalty. And Matthew follows him. And so, and they're condemning them. And there's others like him that uh, were coming to him. And, uh, and the Pharisees are getting... So, so uh, what God wants is covenant. It's what any husband wants, right? <laughs> we want loyalty. We want any relationship. We want covenant loyalty. And we should not think that God is so different from us in that regard. He, if we can understand the importance of loyalty, how much more him? And so the, go ahead. The interesting thing is the Pharisees always ask the question, when does the law not apply to that's what they always want to know. When is the law not the law? And the interesting thing was here he is, he's sitting with tax collectors. And they knew where the law applied. And they knew they were guilty. And they knew there were sinners. But the Pharisees, they didn't. They didn't know. So, I mean, that kind of shows you, I guess, the small wall. The, 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 the sinners and the tax collectors knew more about the law so to speak, than what the Pharisees did. They knew the law always applied. It's just the Pharisees tried to uh, do the uh, W.C. Fields thing. They were always looking for loopholes. They were looking for when And that's not, out. and that, that's exactly what Hosea 6.6 6 yeah. speaks against. That's not what I want. I want covenant loyalty. Well, I, I give you that example just because... Um, Jesus makes it clear in the language he uses. Scripture has meaning. He uses the text uh, in a couple of different places to apply it. He doesn't change the meaning, and he does that with other scripture as well. But enough here to say that i am give you a definition uh, or some definitions of a uh, single meaning. Uh, bottom of page one, the meaning expressed in a, each biblical text is single, definite, and fixed. Milton Terry said it like this, a fundamental principle in the grammatical historical exposition is that the words and sentences can have but one significance in one and the same connection. The moment we neglect this principle, we drift out upon a sea of uncertainty and conjecture. So in other words, so here's, here's what he's saying. If you say there's three or four meanings, how... How, how do we get to a sea of conjecture? If there's not one meaning, let's just say there's two meanings. Where does the authority start to migrate to? To the person making the decision. Yeah, if you got if you got three or four, yeah, if you got three or four different, you can see how if you if you're if you're coming to the text and saying, well, there's three or four meanings here then uh, who's the authority? Which one applies? And so all of a sudden you start getting to conjecture. I think this one. I think this one. Um, yeah, so... How does it make me feel? Yeah, well, exactly. And, 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 and we're going to get to some of that uh, uh, tonight. Um, this does not deny that there can be many applications of a text. One meaning, yet many applications... And I would even say there can even be many implications. Uh, I think that Jesus, when he used, we looked at that text last time, uh, where he, or I don't know, a couple of times ago, 
I don't remember which one, maybe. When we, when, uh, um, about the resurrection, he, he details important to Jesus. He hung the whole argument upon the tense of a single verb. Uh, um, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so uh, when, he's, when he's talking, when Moses is talking to Jesus, or talking to the um, uh, burning bush, the Lord, I think pre-incarnate Christ, but anyway, uh, when he's talking there, um, he, um, is, that a, is that in a context about the resurrection? Or is that in a context about uh, the afterlife or whatever? It's not. But there he, may, he makes a statement that has implications. And so there's an implication when he is saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though he's not talking in the context of resurrection, there is an implication they are still alive. So for the, he, there are certain things that are assumed to be true or implied to be true by making a statement. And so I'd say, yeah, there are many uh, applications. There are, uh, could be multiple implications, but there is one meaning. When God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, guess what he was saying? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's now there's a lot of that in, that implies Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are real people and all that. There's some application that then Jesus is going to use to 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 deal with the Pharisees on. I, I say that because what we're dealing with in our day and age, uh, just here is a very. Uh, have you guys ever heard Peter ends? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So listen. Yeah, Jesus gets a big fat F in Bible. You've got to be pretty bold to write that, right? And what he's, what he's saying is that, uh, really kind of mocking this historical, grammatical interpret, uh, method, he's saying, he says, look, my main, pol- my main point is this, loosey-goosey handling of the Bible gets you a bad grade, right? Because you just can't make the Bible mean whatever you feel like it means, Right? You have to stick to what the text says, right? Everybody who takes the Bible seriously knows that, right? Except for Jesus. So in other words, if I graded, so he's saying Jesus doesn't pay attention to what it says. He doesn't stick to what the text says. And um, so anyway, yeah, so yeah, off the deep end. But but this is our postmodern world coming into the realm of her. But when you look at Jesus... He does know what the text says, and he stays to it, and he drives, uh, he drives implications and applications from that. But he keeps the meaning the same. You can take every time that there's a multiple text, Jesus uses a text in multiple situations, and it's not too many times. There's not, there's not a whole lot of data there, so it's not hard to chase it down. But uh, every time he uses a text in more than one setting, he doesn't change the meaning. He applies the same principle. So, and he says, go learn what this means. Singular. Don't come back and bring about, what do you think? You know, bring back a, a, a clever interpretation. No. Definite. He's fixed. So he's given him instructions, commands. Uh, meaning is singular. And I believe that if you study the life of Christ, that, that's what you get. And so, Bernard Ram says it well. Uh, we must remember the old adage, interpretation is one, application is meaning, is many. This means there is only one meaning to a passage of Scripture, which is determined by careful study. Uh, now, when you go through the history of the church, um, you have uh, multiple meanings in history. And uh, origin really kind of starts introducing the whole allegorical uh, method. But listen to what Augustine says. Uh, Augustine's Christian doctrine, uh, this is on page two, uh, is uh, the perhaps probably the earliest manual of biblical hermeneutics. It, in it, he presses the view that the scripture is designed to have more, than ter- more interpretations than one. Listen to this. When again, not some one interpretation, but two or more interpretations are put upon the same words of scripture, even though the meaning of 
the writer intended remain undiscovered, there is no danger if it can be shown from other passages of Scripture that any of the interpretations put on the words is in harmony with the truth. So what he's saying is, okay, if you don't really know what the meaning is there, it's okay. If as long as you let, you know, interpret it in line with, uh, with the truth, but the question is, how do we know truth except through the words of truth? And so starting to get into a circular. But then he says this, for what more liberal and more fruitful provision could God have made in regard to the sacred scriptures than that the same words might be understood in several senses, all of which are sanctioned by the concurring testimony of other passages equally divine. So this passage could be interpreted in one sense, sense two, sense three, and as long as it's in harmony with the rest of the scripture, it's okay. But you get into a cycle there, right? Uh, how do we know what w one part of Scripture says? Uh, we have to, it has to have a meaning, or we can't understand how to compare it. So, um, uh, and uh, he, he says it like this, his supreme test of love. Uh, scripture has more than one meaning, and therefore the allegor allegorical method is proper. Uh, the supreme test of, of determining whether a passage is allegorical is that of love. If a literal interpretation makes for dissension, then the passage is to be allegorized. So that goes back to... But so what comes out of this early, early uh, patristic period? You have all these different streams of patristic hermeneutics. They're interpreting the Bible... Uh, church is going in different directions and you're getting these uh, fathers, early church fathers in different areas and they're interpreting they become these different streams of hermeneutics and so then uh, they in the middle ages these all these streams kind of converge and you come up with what is called the four senses of scripture and this is kind of what dominates if you will all the way up until the time of the reformation uh, the fourfold sense of Scripture, and still uh, argued today in uh, different circles, but uh, uh, not so much in uh, uh, those in a, a true uh, Reformation uh, uh, lineage. Of. But uh, but here you have okay. So you give you an idea of the fourfold sense. You've got the literal sense. I mean, how many guys is this is familiar to you? Okay, you guys been down this down this road. Okay, well, I won't belabor the thought, but just just to bring it back fresh, uh, the literal sense. Okay, there's a literal sense, and that's the plain meaning of scripture in its historical context. The literal sense could nurture the virtues of faith, hope, and love, and when it did not, the interpreter could appeal to three other senses. Okay, the allegorical sense. It it was something that referred to the church and its faith, some kind of comparison, what, what, what the church was to believe, allegorical. Um, the tropological, and this was like the moral sense, referred to individuals, what they should do. So the idea, you know, you, you hear some preachers are, they, they preach very moralistically. So they, as they go through, it, they reduce things to just a set of morals. So the trop tropological is that there's a moral sense that we need to g take out, and um, and that becomes a meaning. We're not talking application. We're talking this is what that means, and we'll we'll all agree there's many applications, but we're talking about meaning here. Then the anagogical sense pointed to the church church's expectation corresponding to hope, or what it leads up to. So an example of the city of Jerusalem and all of its appearances in Scripture was understand literally as what? Jewish city. Allegorically, as the church of Jesus Christ. Tropologically, as the souls of men and women. And anagogically, as the heavenly city. Okay, so you... So every time you see the Jerusalem, it can mean any one of these four things. And whatever context you're in or however it suits you need, this becomes the meaning. So you start getting um, a lot of different, 
directions. Now let's just, uh, let's just do a little example here. Let's just, can you take one of these and pass it around? This is a passage that you're all familiar with. And let's just, I want to make sure you have this concept. So, I'm going to Joshua, chapter 2. What is the scarlet cord? Joshua 2. How are we to understand uh, Joshua 2, uh, chapter 17, verses 17 and 18? Okay, so um, uh, the men said to her, I'll just read right there off, off the sheet. The men said to her, We will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord. That's the issue we're trying to understand. What is the scarlet cord in the window which you let down? And you shall gather into your house your father and your mother, your brothers and fathers and households. So what's going on there? What is this scarlet cord? I'm going to talk about it literally. What is it? Scarlet cord. A red ribbon. A red, and why do you think it's red? Because it was not in Texas and they did not have yellow ribbon. And they did not have yellow. Yeah, they hadn't gotten with the times yet. What else? What other? Well, I mean, you could go on, take it back to, uh, you know, during the Exodus when they painted the blood. Okay, well, yeah. Blood that. So, so, you, so you think in some way it... it so it could somewhat tie back because she's hanging this thread out so they will overlook you know she'll survive the old bypasser mm. I think red would be easier to see than like FDA well yeah, that's true too but they didn't have red lights back then I mean you mean put on the red light yeah right. okay. no I mean no seriously I mean she was a prostitute it's, it's how would you know is this door not the next door so so if you're if, now think I about mean, think and, and, but as far as the purpose of the cord, why would you have a red cord? I mean, if I'm going to have rope, I'm not going to have red rope. And anyway, go ahead. You're, you're going somewhere, and I'm taking time. Yeah, no, no. You're, 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 I think you're right on. What is the purpose of this? You've got an army coming in. There's giving commands. There is a place that has to be preserved. And what is the purpose of a, what, what would be nice way to mark it? Some, some way, some way that would cost her her life before they got there. Right. So basically, applying her same trade. Yeah, yeah. Take well, she's got red cord, or and it may have been purple. You can go back and forth. Was it purple, red, whatever? Point is, it's a bright color, right? It's probably put out there so that you can see it. it has a very practical function. An army is coming in. They need to know where to identify. This red cord clearly identifies. And uh, so it probably has a very practical purpose to be seen, right? And so literally, uh, understand it as a very practical. But this is not how I, he I heard it growing up, right? In fact, when I was in Africa, we were talking about this. And uh, I, I said to, to the guys, I said, so what is... The red cord. Oh, pastor, that's the blood of Jesus. That's the blood of Jesus. I say, well, no, it, it, uh, but it, does it say blood of Jesus? No, but it's the blood of Jesus. And then the other guy starts to say, well, it's a red cord. And we start working, you know, but that's how, when I heard first, that's how I grew up understanding this. That's the blood of Jesus. Is it the blood of Jesus? The problem is, is what you've done when you say it's the blood of Jesus is you've gone back and put the New Testament in the Old Testament, essentially. Yeah. I mean, yes, it's the red cord. And, you know, the only other thing that you could additionally say on this is when they marched around and they blew the horn and everything and the walls collapsed. Her wall did. Yeah. This is the only one that did. So go from there. Yeah, so, so okay. So, okay. Literally... Just to keep moving on, it's a cord. 
And this is what I'm arguing, the literal, it is a chord, okay? And we're to understand it as literal chord. That's what the literal interpretation, now give me an allegorical interpretation. Now if you're gonna allegorize this, what would be a good allegorize? It's just like my friend, right? Ah, that's the blood of Jesus, right? You're right, that's, yeah, that's the allegorical. And so now we're bringing our thoughts. Got a thought? I think from the point I saw origin in there, it I see this moving toward a loosey goosey. You can make up your own make believe, okay. and, it, and it bothers me. And, it, and it's not that it's not the blood of Jesus. I mean, yeah, I can I can see that. But, but you're talking here's the cord. Yeah, it's a cord. It was red, and some she had around. You know, she didn't have to go to the next city to get it. And yeah, in a sense, yes, you do have that other. But when you start going off on those allegorical, GMB, right. how, how are you going to convince somebody it's this or that? Right. I mean, once again, what was the meaning at the time? What was it the woman was doing? She's trying to show where she was so that she'll be protected. Right. I think God honored that because if she's there in the wall and it got destroyed, she would have died even though the spy right. said, hey, we'll protect you. Now you she, she's dead when they get there. Exactly. Now, you can tie all that to the salvation motif, to the deliverance motif, to the evidence of faith. You can put all of that in there, but it's not because you're interpreting it allegorically. No, it means a chord. Allegorically, okay, now we can start making it, oh, it's the blood of Christ. Oh, it's the Passover lamb. It's the, you can look back, you can look forward. And all, but here's the danger with the allegorical method is you're letting your systematic theology drive the interpretation of the text. And you're going to get where you want to go. Exactly. So you've got a framework that you're bringing to bear that is going beyond the normal. Now, uh, what is the tropological interpretation? Let's just, just to make sure we kind of got a, uh, what would you say is a tropological? Now keep in mind, this is kind of a moralistic if you can try to drink, get some more. Well, I wonder if you're going to more of us if you're like, well, they didn't have red lights, back, red lights back then, so they put them in a red cord. I don't know. Is it yeah. based on the allegorical or based no, on the allegorical? No, just, on, just, on the, the, just as you're looking at this and you're looking for moralistic meaning, what are some lessons well, you might... You're, you're, saved saved by the, by the, you're saved by the blood of Jesus. You're saved by the blood of Jesus, moralistically? Be a sign of the herd on the street outside. Yeah. How about be nice to strangers? How about honor your covenant? Honor your word? How about, and you can really, you can start seeing, okay, we're looking for tropological. Now, are, those, are there some good lessons for us on that in there? Sure. Is that the meaning? No. Anagogical. What's our hope? I mean, like, like if you're thinking uh, anagogically, uh, in this fourfold sense, and you apply the anagogical, what, is this, what does this look like? And keep in mind, you're looking for the future, future hope. Maybe like one day we will be gloriously saved, God will return, or maybe his second coming. Something, something framework with, with the future hope. Yeah, and, and, and I say all that, and it's important to understand that if you, if you, um, we do that, we, we sometimes will jump to the allegorical because we can't find too much to say about just a red cord. We see a lot of motifs going in there, but we, we just feel like we need to go there. And what happens is we then leave what's clearly building up to that. For instance, What's, if you go back to uh, Joshua 2, and just go back to maybe uh, verse 8. Okay, so you know the spies are in the land. And listen to what Rahab says. Uh, verse 9. Uh, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you, I know. Now keep, a whole generation of Israel just died 
because they didn't believe God was going to give them the land. Here is this Canaanite prostitute that's saying, I know God has given you the land. And then she goes on, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And she goes on and she says, When we heard it, verse 11, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God. Now keep in mind, the whole generation saw God open the water. She just heard. And she's believing. She's an example of faith, right? And, and, uh, and the certainty of faith. And she's like, He is God. And so, um, and so she, she sees that in uh, verse 18, you know, they make this promise. Okay, give evidence of your faith. And, you know, so we'll give evidence of this. They make this covenant. And so here's this cord, this car. It's, a, it's a, a practical symbol, outward sign of the covenant that was made between them. And Israel honored the covenant. God honored uh, Rahab. And then... Um, and so Rahab's faith strengthened Israel's faith. After, you know, in verse 24, they said to Joshua, Surely, these are the spies, they come back. Surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, the inhabitants of the land have melted away because of us. And so you get this whole picture. Uh, but what other things can you see? Just... Instead of running to the blood, blood of Christ, bringing in New Testament, what's going on right here? He's actually, what's happening here is giving you a picture of what's going to come in the New Testament. Here's an example, just like, do you have Rahab? Do you have Ruth? Yes. She's in the line, isn't she? Yeah. She's in the line all the way. They were Gentiles. Well, in her faith, it's just like what we were talking about with the two thieves. I mean, the one thief didn't see it, and the one did, and it was only because the Lord opened his eyes. Yeah, and it's interesting, like, you, you see that um, Rahab and Joshua 6.22, the two men who had spied out the land said, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out here as you have sworn to her. And so they brought her out, and in verse 25, however, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had Joshua spared, and she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers. So you see the faithfulness of God. You see, you see that that uh, you see the faith of Rahab, and then you see that faith gives evidence. You see that faith is met with the faithfulness of God. God is faithful, but you also see um, the impartiality of God, don't you? And you start seeing like here is a Canaanite prostitute exhibiting faith she lives there's a whole generation of Israel that did not and they died in the wilderness and so you hear all these conquest critics coming in saying okay uh, uh, about the evil of, of, of God or the imp but it's like he's impartial and you go on through and so when you Get to then you're starting to build and understand it's her faith that really, and so yes, there is a salvation motif. So I don't say you can't get to the cross from here, but you need to do it legitimately. Like here's the salvation motif, here's the covenant faithfulness of God. We see it there, and we see even a uh, more precise, definite, full picture of God's salvation in Jesus Christ on the cross. You don't have to make this be Jesus on the cross. Get there. A few weeks ago, I, I asked you a question. If, if, if it is uh, necessary to always, whenever we, we, we preach or we teach, to always take it back to the cross, like, do we always have to land on, you know, the cross? Like? Well, we are ministers of the new covenant. I think we are to go where the text goes, and I think the scripture knows what it's doing. Now, we have the whole complete canon, and I think if you're preaching something like this and a salvation motif like this and a deliverance motif and the faith, and, and if uh, it's not just a historical 
event. It's, some, it's revealing something about God that we see in the cross, um, uh, a completed picture of more, you know, as revelatory history comes on, we see, okay, it's son. We see, we don't see the blood of Christ splattered on, uh, on Rahab's house. We see a cord. We see uh, God's faithfulness to her. But yeah, I, I do think that you don't have to make this exegetically but in the bigger stream, yeah, the scripture does. They but they get to they point to Christ. I think of like think like the Mississippi. It empties into uh, the ocean, right? And and I would say yes. The the scriptures they reveal Christ. They promote Christ. They glorify Christ. They're bringing Him to the picture. They're going to transform us into the. So it is about Christ. That is the Mississippi, if I will. But there's a lot of tributaries. They get there, but uh, uh, some of the tributaries don't jump directly into the ocean. So you've got to make sure you're going through the scriptural, the prophetic revelation as it is giving. And um, I, uh, I know our time's limited, but let's, let's just look. Let's go a couple more pages. I give you more, but... Um, when you come to the time of the Reformation, the Reformation um, really, it's not just to say that it's, it's a Reformation of authority. It's a Reformation of hermeneutics. Yes, biblical authority, scripture alone, but also how do we get to the meaning? And so when you start looking at what happens in the Reformation, it is a reformation to how we approach Scripture. Uh, for instance, the excessive, excessive taste of this fourfold style of interpretation was sternly rebuked by the Reformers. Especially did Luther utter his protest on the ground that, he, that the fancies into which this method was apt to lead had a tendency to shake the confidence in the literal truth. And that's where we got to go, is to the literal truth. He, says, he said, Augustine said beautifully that a figure proves nothing, but probably from the high regard he had for the great theologian, he did not condemn uh, Augustine for his allegorizing exegesis. I mean, Augustine says a lot of great things. I mean, he really is spot on, but, but he did, uh, like those other Alexandrians down there, they, they, they got into some uh, allegorical um, exegesis. Um, Luther said it like this. When I was a monk, I was an expert in allegories. I allegorized everything. But after lecturing on the epistles of the Romans, I came to have knowledge of Christ. For therein I saw that Christ is no allegory. And I learned to know what Christ is. He says this. Allegories are empty speculations and as it were the scum of Holy Scripture. Origins, <laughs> Luther, what do you really think? Origins, allegories are not, so, are not worth so much dirt. To allegorize is to juggle the scripture. Allegorizing may degenerate into mere monkey game. He's trying to tell us what he thinks. He's trying to get it across, right? Yeah. I think if we had it in the German, he'd probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other thing to add on, you know, here we got Luther or Augustine. You have Luther and you have Calvin. Calvin actually preached from the Greek. Yeah. He stood up with his Greek yeah. and preached it straight, straight from the Greek. And um, so that's the big thing about them is they got away from the Latin Vulgate, which we found out now the Latin Vulgate they used was a bad translation. I mean, we realize that now that it was really bad. But they thought it was wonderful. What else that was the translation they endorsed. And of course, we also had to remember prior to 15, 15, or 16, or whatever, and from the fourth century to there, there's only one church. That's it. So, and I give you a lot. You can keep. I give you more, more, uh, uh, more uh, Tyndale. You know, scripture is but one sense, and it's the literal sense. Uh, and his literal sense is the spiritual sense. I mean, he Tyndale has a lot to say about it. Um, 
Then you have uh, the Council of Trent. I give you, um, uh, and then I give you some of the stuff from the Council of Trent, page five, and then quoted some parts of the Catechism of the Catholic Church that stands today. Uh, the apostles entrusted the sacred deposit of the faith contained in the sacred scriptures and tradition, not just scripture, but scripture and tradition, to the whole of the church. By adhering to this heritage, the entire holy people united to its pastors remains always faithful to the teaching of the apostles to the brotherhood. And then he says, um, um, the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God whether in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted through the living teaching office of the Catholic Church alone. Its authority. So uh, this means that the interpretation has been trusted to the bishops in communion with the successor of Peter, the Bishop of Rome. And they champion still to this day the fourfold sense. And so it's like, and these are the, what the Catholic um, which, which you have in the you know, catechism as the authority. So I would, I'm going, we're going to have to end it there. Uh, but the the lingering question, well, I just give that any any questions. Uh, I, I give you some examples from uh, Luke chapter 10 and um, and so answering some problems, like some objections to. The um, the singular meaning. Um, what about Old Testament passages like Psalm 22, uh, where New Testament uses it clearly? And answer to that as quickly. A scripture can have one meaning but multiple reference. So uh, reference. So in other words, Psalm 22 speaking about David. And uh, when you get on the cross, you're, you're, uh, you're dealing with Jesus on the cross. And what's happened in David's life becomes uh, now part of the prophetic. But you don't really know that until you get to um, the New Testament. So you have one meaning, but multiple reference. So that doesn't, that's no reason to, uh, Old Testament types are another objection. What about types? Clearly the Passover lamb was pointing forward to something. Yes, but it was a literal lamb. When that blood went up there, it was it was actual blood, it was actual blood of, of, that an actual, dead lamb. of that dead lamb. Now, it's testifying. If, you're, if that's happened to you, if you're, and you come out the next morning, everyone's dead, and, and you, but you've been passed over. It's like, okay, God's got something going on here. And it is to cause you to think, but it's from that literal event. So types are not to be understood or a justification to then start allegorizing scripture. I wonder if the cord was more of a sign of really the agreement or covenant that they had with the spies and her as a sign outside and maybe draw a correlation with that because I mean certainly you know if I was baptized by another person, yes they did it to me, but it's symbolic you know, with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. Because, yeah, I can understand, oh, you know, it's, it's Christ's blood. I, I do think in a sense, yeah, but, man, that's not, it's not the place to go. You can get to salvation motif, yeah. passed over, saved, but you, but you don't have to make it say something it's not to get there because it is there in the context. The covenant that you just talked about, you can draw that from uh, Joshua 2 and Joshua 6 and all that. You can, you can, point is, stay there, get, draw that out of there. Don't bring it in from over here. And really, that's what, friends, as you go through this, you're, you're wanting your systematic theology to be more, become more and more biblical. And the way that happens is, yeah, the systematic theology becomes kind of the boundary, boundary markers. And, that, but as you, as you, you don't want your systematic to drive your interpretation of Scripture. You want to develop a biblical theology. You want each Scripture to say what it says in its context, and you want to hold the literal, and let that correct the systematic. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church did, right? That's exactly what uh, the J Jewish tradition, you know, it's like, okay, this doesn't fit within our tradition, and their tradition starts hamstringing. And so we want to 
But we're constantly coming to Scripture, letting it inform us, and then not being afraid to go where that goes. And if there's something like, okay, I've got the, I've got holding A in my systematic, and this seems to not quite fit. I'm not going to reconcile that right now. I'm just going to keep going. You know. What if it, what if it preaches really, really well, and you're running out of time? <laughs> well, that's that's where that's we are. Yeah, that I disagree with doing that, but at some point, I, I wonder sometimes, growing up in the '60s and '70s, if there weren't a lot of things that were taught and preached because it preached well. Oh yeah. Even though theologically there wasn't but maybe half a leg to stand on. Right. And I worry that that's where a lot of the bad theology that we find in a lot of the small little country churches that need revitalization, if that isn't where it comes from. Because it preaches like cheap, easy... Well, that was, that was like cheese with cheese was preaching. Well, the thing that you get into right on the back, you know, growing up and stuff, a lot of the preachers, and they still do it, is they preach topical. Right. Oh yeah. And when you teach preach topical rather than expositional or through scripture and actually using scripture as your base, the problem is, is you get you have a tendency, well, Fred's really getting on my nerves. I need to really zing Fred over here with my next sermon or this group over here is getting a little clicky, so I need to preach a sermon and take care of that. And you right. get that problem when you do topical. Whereas if you were just preaching scripture, God will take care of that for you. You'd be amazed at what God brings out in people's hearts. When you preach the word, he takes care of you. You know, you talk about I'm not I'm not people after that. You know, some of those sermons. And I'm just like my mouth's open because how did you hold spirit with what you right. did? I, well, that's what you gotta have. God controls the results. We're I'm, supposed to be getting up, being the mouthpiece, professing, interpreting, and telling them what Scripture says. I think that's a very important concept. I think we be, we begin with the Word knows what it's doing, Amen. and and we proclaim, we give utterance to it, and and um, and. So do you find some kind of a common character flaw or something that causes a person to slip into allegory? I mean, right off the bat, I would say they're not being led by the Holy Spirit if you're going to try to interpret this into some crazy Well, I think a lot of it is, is part of You've got well-meaning people who may not have the time. They get there, and they take the low-hanging fruit. They, they, they talk. They, they start talking just what comes to their to their mind, and... And they're thinking it's the Holy Spirit, and um, and and so I don't know if it's if it's it's all somebody that's just. But I do think there's some laziness. So if you were counseling somebody that has taken this route, I mean, would you say maybe you need to do a little better preparation? Or yeah, I think a lot of of pastoral ministry is planting your rear end in a chair and getting your mind and heart around the text and and let and preach come to the text let it shape you let it grip you and let that come out it's not so much the homiletics yes work on the homiletics keep working on that but you've got to be communicating something that has gripped you because if it hasn't gripped you it's not going to it's not going to come through a lot of these preachers they're looking for what Billy out there in the pew needs instead of what God's trying to tell them too. Exactly. There's well, and it bothers me sometimes. I, I, I hear it said that it bothers me these days where you know, I hear the preachers say you know, and they're a topical preacher and I said, well God laid this on my heart. Yeah. And I hear that and that's almost like, well I was really kind of lazy and thought about putting this up. Because, you know, you can tell already we were only three units in this isn't something that you can just whip out in an afternoon. Right. Mm -hmm. you got to spend several. You got to spend several days doing this thing. This isn't right. something that you just toy with. And I think that for some people may put them off. Like, well, I don't. Want, I don't have that kind of time. Well, you better have that kind of time because that's what you were called to do. Your responsibilities to the sheep and to God. 